people are talking in the afternoon. Well, it was in 1955 when a disc jockey by the name of Alan Freed coined the phrase rock and roll, and there was no entertainer more a part of that era than this afternoon's guest. His hard-driving style and his flamboyancy created an awful lot of hits. through such classics as Slippin' in a Slidin', Tutti Fruity, Good Golly, Miss Molly, and the list goes on. Would you please welcome Little Richard. Welcome to People Are Talking. Glad to be here. Nice to have you here. Thanks. Your life has been so dramatic. Did you ever think as a small boy in Macon, Georgia, that you were going to be a big rock and roll star? Um, I wanted to be, but I couldn't think about it because there wasn't nothing that big in my hometown. The biggest thing in my hometown was the jailhouse. Um, <laughs> I, never, um, I never thought that I would be uh, famous. I always wanted to be famous, you know, when the teacher would say, um, uh, Essie, what you want to be? She said, school teacher. Uh, John, what you want going to be? He said, mortician. So said, Richard, what you want to be? I said, a movie star. She said, oh, shut your mouth. <laughs> she says, it's no stars ever left out of this place. So I wanted to leave because I really wanted to shine. So I was singing to the fruity, you know, in Macon when I was a little boy. I was saying, wop, bop, loop, bop, lop, bam, boom, but there was nobody boom for me. <laughs> uh, 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 but I just kept on. I was singing uh, loose uh, uh, tutti fruity when I was a little boy, slipping on the slide, and I was singing that when I was a little boy. So when you ran away with Dr. Hudson's Dr. Medicine, Hudson's medicine show, show, yes, you knew you wanted to be a big star. Yeah, but I, I didn't see that when I was with Dr. Hudson because one nothing never snake oil. Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Hudson would go to the different cities and he would tell these black people that this medicine was good for everything. Rheumatism, arthritis, or whatever you had, and they was buying it. And I found out that he was the snake. The oil wasn't the snake. <laughs> he was taking their money. And then I left there and I went with a show called um, Sugarfoot Sam from Alabama. And I started singing there. Then I left there and joined the circus, King Brothers Circus. And I thought that they was going to put me on the stage. And they put me in the kitchen. So I had to leave there. Because <laughs> I had done enough dish washing in my home. I didn't want to wash no more dishes. So I left there. Then I had to come back to Macon. And I started washing dishes at the Greyhound bus station. I was making $15 a week, working 12 hours a day. Lord Price came to my hometown. He had our Lordy Miss Claudia. And I told him, I said, you know, I can sing better than you. And so he didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, won't you send a tape to Special Records? So I made this tape to send to Special Records. And they got back in touch with me one year later. And I went to New Orleans. And they wanted me to sound like Ray Charles and B.B. King. And so I was singing all these low-down blues. And when the session was over, I started to play the piano. They didn't know that I played piano. I was playing the piano and singing the wop, bop, loo, bop, lop, bam, boom. But it wasn't too the fruity or rude. It was too the fruity something else. So uh, they got the girl to clean it up and put, I got a gal named Sue, she knows what to do. I got a gal named Daisy, she almost drive me crazy. So we had to change it around, you know, but it became an instant hit. And I got so big that the white girls and the white guys were screaming over me. So they threw Elvis Presley on me to stop that. I was getting too big. You know, because I was with R.S.A. Victor before Elvis. I was recording for them in 1951. The black artist was on Camden. Then Pat Boone covered me with Tutti Frutti. Now, when you say covered, you mean he made He, he recorded made the same song of, of my yeah. music that I've written. Uh, the white kids would buy his Tutti Frutti and put it on the dresser. They would get my Tutti Frutti and put it in the drawer. So their mother wouldn't know they had mine. We, we was in the same room, but different locations. Did you mean to tell me that they were, they were, they were really worried about young white girls just screaming, screaming, over, screaming over you? That's the reason I started wearing makeup. I started wearing eyelashes because that was my only way out. In Georgia, I was a threat because I was one of the few black artists. When I came on the scene, it was called race music. I was the first black artist to hit the top 40 uh, uh, and become a, 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 that hero thing, you know, where all the kids are trying to dress like you and look like you. And so when, when I put on the eyelashes and the makeup and the headband that Prince and Michael and Boy George and David Bowie is doing today uh, that I started, uh, uh, and the sequins and beads and uh, uh, mirrors and glass, I wore everything they had in the house. Chandeliers, yeah. I hang them on my head. <laughs> <laughs> So when you, 
When you went out to Hollywood and you went into that recording studio, yes. because Tutti Frutti was your first. That's video. my first. Video. That was by accident. I it mean, was by accident. Yes. Uh, I, by the way, I recorded that in New Orleans at a studio called Cosmo Studio. I had a little Chrysler. My mother paid two hundred dollars for it. I thought it was a big, and we paid nine hundred dollars for our house. You know, I thought we was rich. You know, uh, that was. $1,100, that was a lot of money to me in those days. And so I went to New Orleans at Cosmo Studio and I was just playing the piano. And, and when I would do this, woo, but they uh, <clears throat> get my voice ready for my song, go woo. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I would do that, they, they just had a fit, you know. And so the, when the music came out, the, the white kids really went for me in a big way. They still do, you know, 98% of my audience was white. I would go to Madison Square Garden, I would have 35,000 people. I would have 20 black people. James Brown would come and have 35,000 black and 20 white people. It was just the, just the opposite. You know, uh, uh, the white kids have always loved me. And, and then the black kids, my audience was black at first. It was total black, and you would have white spectators upstairs. But Tutti Frutti, Good Golly, Miss Molly, Long Tall Sally, Slipping on the Slide of Lucille, Jenny Jenny, uh, uh, The Girl Can't Help It, Rip It Up, Ready Teddy. She's got, they brought the races together. The white people start leaping over the balcony for my music, and it got down with the blacks, and so they pulled everybody in one, made them that bouquet that God want us to be. And you know what? It's just amazing. All the rock stars that we have now were influenced by, by you. By me, yes. They really were. Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger. Beatles. The Beatles started with me. I, Brian Epstein brought me to Liverpool, and when I got there, he had these four guys. He said, I want them to meet you because they never met no famous person before. And the Beatles, they just held my hand. Paul pulled my finger. John laid on my shoulders. They just took me over, and I liked it every minute of it. But what really, really happened was, Oh, there they are. Did Hello, you, Paul. Did you think they were talented? Oh, oh uh, uh, no, I thought they weren't going nowhere but back home to their mamas yeah. uh, 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 at the time. I didn't think they was going to make it because they offered me 50% of them. Brian Epstein offered me 50%, and I said, no, no way. I ain't going to waste my time. Mick Jagger was opening my show. I, don't, I felt that Paul had to tell him, but I felt nobody else had any. I was wrong again. I've been wrong many times. Uh, um, <laughs> the Rolling Stones was opening my show. Jimi Hendrix was my guitar player, 19 years old. Billy Preston was my organist at the age of 14. James Brown was my vocalist. Can you imagine that group? We have to, uh, now we have to go to a commercial break. I already come back and you're going to sing. But uh, David Bowie was really interesting. David Bowie it. said that if it wasn't for me, he would have never been a star. Uh, uh, not only Otis Reddins. Um, in fact, most everybody came from me. I just feel like a tree with many... Uh, I ain't gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back with uh, uh, a little Richard. He's gonna sing for us right after this. <laughs> If 
if I could tell the world about all my affliction. You know, some of these could also tell that stories too. Roger had a question for you. Where's Roger? There he is, right there. Roger. Roger, I'm Roger. sorry. Yes. I'd like to ask you about your piano playing style. Uh -huh. uh, most a rock and roll uh, singers say bang, 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 bang. Mm -hmm. But you have a, when you play that, it's a, it's a delayed feeling. It's a groove that nobody can play but you. <laughs> and I want to ask you about that style. Maybe you can demonstrate a little bang, 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 bang. <laughs> I, I forgot how to bang, bang, bang. <laughs> if it's a loser, I bang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, am I banging me? Yang, yang, yang. <laughs> God. Roger? Oh, by the way, I know Roger. I used to work with him. Oh, you did? Uh, yes, I've been knowing him for a long time. You look good, boy. <laughs> what you been doing? <laughs> Who did it to you? <laughs> okay, back to the style. Hey, Roger's my friend. Uh, Roger, what happened is um, a guy by the name of Escarita, uh, uh, which is a terrible guy, uh, uh, he makes you be glad when you get on the plane to go home. <laughs> I ain't lying, either. I'm telling the truth. I was in New York a few days ago, I was glad to leave. Uh, but he's a very good pianist, you know. He taught me how to play one mint julep. Uh, I couldn't play at all, and he taught me how to play. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it's just, uh, I really don't know what I'd be doing, earnest let's, to God. Let's, I, let's hear a little. Uh, uh, um, I, 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 I really, I am practicing. I'm really, I have, I'm, I'm self-conscious when it comes to my playing. Uh, 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 I'm very self-conscious. I, I want to say that. That, uh, if you listen to a whole lot of shaking going on by Jerry Lee Lewis, oh, you can hear that he took that from the way Richard plays that. Oh, so yeah, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Spot that you play. But you can, you, you yeah, can. Jerry, don't that. hide it. Jerry, Jerry, tell me, Sir Richard, I took it. I said, bring it back, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry Lee used more than. You know, he's, he's a, you know, woo, Jerry, I see why you don't do it now. We'll take commercial break. We'll come Thank back. Let's you. talk about the competition that uh, maybe went on between you and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis yes. and little, you know, you yes. and little Richard during the that's, 1950s. That's right. we'll the 1950s. Was there a lot of competition between you and Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and all? Uh, yes. What happened is, when I first came on the scene, Chuck Berry was singing blues. Fat Seminoles was a blues singer. He was singing like, going home tomorrow, can't stand your evil ways. Chuck Berry was doing stuff like Deep Feeling and, you know, stuff like Muddy Waters. Uh, uh, so when I came out with all this wild thing, it was kind of different, you know. Uh, in fact, everybody went against me when I came out. You know what I'm saying? It was terrible. You know, a man with makeup on, with eyelashes like a lady, you know, uh, uh, with headbands and uh, uh, all these sequins around your neck. See, I never heard of Liberace in that time. You know, I didn't, I'm not saying he wasn't, but I didn't know him. <laughs> and I didn't have no television to see him either. <laughs> no TV in my hometown at all. They had one downtown. The police had one. I forgot. Uh, 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 uh. But, but it, it was really something in those days. No, we got along well because... After I came on the scene, I met Chuck. I met Fat Seminoles before I got famous. Uh, I went to a little club called the Manhattan Club to see him. He had an old station wagon with cardboard in the window to keep the wind out. Uh, um, but Jerry Lee Lewis, I met him because he came out after me. Uh, he was a country singer. And after I came out with Tutti Frutti and uh, Slipping on the Slide and the different things, then he, he came out and he, uh, he would play like me, you know, uh, uh, which uh, Jerry and I are very, very close friends, you know. But he, he, Jerry Lee Lewis is a fantastic pianist and a fantastic artist. I think he's one of the greatest. I really love Jerry. John, you had a question. I was wondering who you were listening to when you were growing up. 
really wasn't nobody to hear. <laughs> I listened to the cows and to the mews. Uh, uh, ooh. When I was a little boy, I used to listen to Mahalia Jackson. She was my idol, and the Clara Ward singers, and Ruth Brown, and, and Roy Brown, and uh, Fats Domino. Uh, he was my idol back in that time. You know, when he sang Going Home Tomorrow, I used to like how he said, you know, he had that little thing. He, you couldn't understand what he was saying, but I said he did it, you know. Uh, one of those things. That, that, that's what I listened to. Wasn't that, and, and like I said, I listened to the birds and the bees and cows. That's the truth. Wasn't nothing else. To, after they stopped that night, you was, it was very quiet. <laughs> Dave, how does your background uh, as an entertainer help you in what you're doing now? Well, if I'd never been a rock and roll singer, I wouldn't be on People Are Talking. <laughs> they they would have told me to stay at home. <laughs> you know, uh, by Tutor Fruity brought me to be old Rudy. Uh, 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 Tutor Fruity got my book out, The Life and Times of Little Richard, which is on the bestseller list over the country today. And uh, I have to tell you, we had Rosemary Clooney on yesterday. She read the book, and she loves it, and she loves your singing. Oh, she my said, God. please tell him. You see what Bette Middle said? Man, give me have that, give my book for me. Uh, 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 uh. See this book? This is my book. Uh, 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 um. This book here, Bette Middle says she read it and the, her rollers popped out of her head. She said she went and put on her gloves because she couldn't hold it. It was too hot to hold. And in fact, I've never seen a book like it in my life. And it's right here in Frisco and Oakland all over the place. The Life and Times, the Quasar. Oh, Richard, boy. <laughs> Scream like a white lady. Woo! <laughs> you know, a black lady says, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, this is a beautiful show. You know, to, to, kind of expand, to kind of expand on what Dave said. Yes. Oh, excuse me, Dave, I forgot what you said. Start again. <laughs> How does your background in entertaining help you in? Oh, everything you're doing what, now. What, what, wait, what happened to me now? I'm excuse me, sorry, Dave. When you get 51, you forget. Like, uh, I forgot that you even said it, but you're all right. Um, <laughs> it, it really helps my background in this way. It helps me to reach people. It helps the different promoters to bring me to different cities to speak. Oh, I am an evangelist, and I'm a minister. You know, some people think when you're a preacher, you're supposed to... <laughs> you don't never smile no more. <laughs> a little boy saw a horse, and he saw all these Christians walk around like this. He saw a big horse in the field. He said, Mama, that's a good Christian, the horse. <laughs> you know, you can smile when you're a Christian. You can be alive. You're supposed to be the happiest person in the world because you have some hope. You know that when the Lord comes, you're going back. And if you don't have no hope, you don't know him. Uh, it helps me a lot. It makes me a better person. It helps me to understand people and to know that God loves everybody where they stand and you come to him as you are. Why did you leave rock and roll the first time? I became a drug addict. Oh, the first time. Well, the second time, I mean. <laughs> I, thought, I thought she said the first time I was in the second, the third, the fourth time. Uh, just just the, the, when I came out of show business. I was just teasing, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want the, the preachers out there to say, oh, I told you he's a hypocrite. I ain't no hypocrite. Uh, uh, some of the biggest hypocrites I found in church, y'all. I found more Christians that don't go to church than I found at the church. Uh, uh, people are just lying. You know, if you believe what you say, live what you think about, what, what it's supposed to be. You know, you make it then. Uh, uh, um, what did you ask me? Uh, why, did you, why, why did you leave it in the first place? <laughs> I, knew what, I knew what you said, but I want them things that I didn't know what you said. Uh, <laughs> what happened is, the reason I left show business, I became a drug addict. I started with just a little marijuana, and in my hometown, Macon, we'd never heard about marijuana before. If you had came and said, Richard, uh, uh, I want some marijuana, I would have took you around to Miss Marijuana's house on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> because that's, her last name was Mary Marijuana, you understand me? I went from marijuana to angel dust. How many of you ever heard of angel dust? Let me see your hands. The angels had nothing to do with that dust. <laughs> I went from angel dust to barbi all types of barbiturates. I became an alcoholic. I started using cocaine. And I tell you, cocaine is hard to get off of. It's a whole lot. Do you use coke? I'm glad you don't. I started using the cocaine. My nose was big enough to park diesel trucks. You could just call me Little Coke instead of Little Richard. And God got me off of it, and he healed my body, and now I am a man of God with a new book called The Life and Times of Little Richard. <laughs> Oh, 
In case you're not aware of it, Little Richard <laughs> has a new book out, The Times of Little Richard. I have a feeling Ginsu knives go on. <laughs> Thank you for being Thank with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Changed since then is that the memory.